Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for coming out for this lecture by Jose Casanova on global religious matters. My name is Tom Manshoff. I'm director of the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs here at Georgetown University. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Jose here to the Riggs Library. Many of you know Professor Casanova's work. Uh, he has been at the New School for Social Research, Professor of Sociology since 1987. He is, and I'm not exaggerating, one of the world's leading sociologists and sociologists of religion, somebody whose work is comparative, uh, transnational, but also international and global in scope. He has a long string of publications. I just want to highlight one, uh, which will be familiar to many of you, his 1994 volume, Public Religions in the Modern World. This book uh, won awards at the time, and I think in retrospect we can say it was a landmark publication, a book about the reemergence of religion in the public sphere around the world, uh, for many the unexpected emergence of religion, a book about how religion intersects with culture, with society, uh, and with politics on a global scale. Recently, uh, he has published in related areas, uh, including religion and migration, including Catholic and Muslim politics. Uh, his current book project, a kind of a successor volume in many ways to that volume I just mentioned, will be on issues of secular and religious modernities in global perspective. So Jose, uh, we're very much looking forward to your remarks. Welcome to Georgetown. Uh, I will note that we'll have some time for questions uh, and answers at the end of the talk and invite you all to join us uh, after that for some refreshments. And please, those of you standing in the back, there's plenty of space up front. Jose Casanova. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you for the kind introduction. Uh, for the invitation to come to Georgetown and to visit the Berkeley Center, and for the opportunity to present before you some of my reflections on what I would like to call global religious matters. You must be curious and not sure what to expect from such a title. The term is broad enough that I could be talking about practically anything, or at least about a long list of things. But it was not my intention in choosing the somewhat pretentious title to awaken your curiosity as much as to suggest that I'm not going to offer a systematic and elaborate scholarly presentation on a particular topic, but rather present some open reflections on some interrelated issues which can legitimately be called global religious matters. That is, religious matters which are attaining increasingly global relevance and which, in my view, are worthy attention of the new Berkeley Center on Religion and World Affairs at Georgetown University. I'm going to focus, or rather simply draw attention, to three such relevant global issues. First, and the need to rethink our received theories of secularization and our secularist worldviews, for they inhibit rather than facilitate a fruitful understanding of contemporary global religious trends, and the need to question critically the contemporary global discourse on Islam as a fundamentalist religion by pointing out the striking similarities they reveal, these global discourses, with the discourses on Catholicism that were so equally predominant throughout the 19th century in Protestant societies. And third, and the increasingly relevant interconnections between global transnational migratory flows of people and transnational religious flows, and the challenges they present for the management of increasing religious pluralism and multicultural and multi ethnic diversity in many societies throughout the world. One could certainly think of many other global religious matters worthy of a scholarly and public attention. But these particular three and their interrelations have been the focus of my scholarly work in the last decade and are likely to remain relevant global religious matters for the foreseeable future. So first, on secularizations and secularisms. And I want to stress the plural and diverse character of historical approach of secularization 
and of secularist ideologies or worldviews. Sociologists have been now debating the inherited secularization theory and the validity of these assumptions concerning the fate of religion in the modern world for several decades. A recent double issue of the Hedgehog Review offers perhaps the best summary of the state of the discussion and of the impasse reached between American and European sociologists of religion on this topic. Is there, interesting enough, the title of the special issue is after secularization. And we are entering this age precisely after secularization, or with Habermas himself, if you can think of a secularist theorist, we are entering a post-secular age. Over a decade ago, in my book, Public Religious in the Modern World, I suggested that in order to speak meaningfully of secularization, we need to distinguish three different connotations. Secularization is the decline of religious beliefs and practices in modern societies, often postulated as the end point of a human universal developmental process. Secularization is privatization of religion, often understood both as a general modern historical trend and as a normative condition, indeed as a precondition for modern liberal democratic politics. And third, secularization as differentiation of the sacred spheres state, economy, science, etc., usually understood as emancipation from religious institutions and norms. Maintaining this analytical distinction, I argued, should allow to examine and to test the validity of each of these three propositions independently of each other, and thus to refocus the often fruitless secularization debate into comparative historical analysis that could account for different patterns of secularization in all three meanings of the term across societies and civilizations. While the decline and privatization thesis have undergone numerous critiques and revisions in the last 15 years, the understanding of secularization as a single developmental process of functional differentiation of the various institutional spheres or subsystems of modern societies remains relatively uncontested in sociological theories of modernity, particularly within European sociology. And I'm, I wrote this when I was working in Europe, as by the reference to European sociology last uh, year. In my previous work, I myself had led the thesis of secular differentiation and touch as the still defensible core of the theory of secularization. But I'm now convinced of the need to challenge also the thesis of secular differentiation, and I would like to contribute to a revisionist a reformulation under the heading of multiple differentiations, multiple secularizations, multiple modernities. This is the kind of the project to which Thomas referred as secular and religious modernities. The reformulation of the thesis should begin with the recognition of the particular Christian historicity of Western European developments, as well as of the multiple and diverse historical patterns of secularization and differentiation within European and Western societies. Such a recognition, in turn, should allow a less Eurocentric comparative analysis of patterns of differentiation and secularization in other civilizations and world religions, and more importantly, the further recognition that with the world historical process of globalization initiated by the European colonial expansion, all these processes everywhere are dynamically interrelated and mutually constituted. There are multiple and diverse secularizations in the West and multiple and diverse Western modernities. And those are still mostly associated with fundamental historical differences between Catholic, Protestant, and Byzantine Christianity and between Lutheran and Calvinist Protestantism. Long time ago, in what remains the unpassed comparative historical account of the diverse patterns of secularization across the West, David Martin so convincingly the need to take into account at least two very different historical patterns of secularization. In the Latin Catholic cultural area, and to some extent throughout continental Europe, there was a collision between religion and the differentiated secular spheres this is, that is between Catholic Christianity and modern science, modern capitalism, and the modern state. As a result of this protracted class, the Enlightenment critic of religion found here ample resonance. The secularization genealogy of modernity was constructed as a triumphant emancipation of 
reason, freedom, and worldly pursuit from the constraints of religion, and practically every progressive European social movement from the time of the French Revolution to the present was informed by secularism. The secular itself narratives, which have informed functionalist theories of differentiation and secularization, have envisioned this process as the emancipation and expansion of the secular spheres at the expense of a much diminished and confined, but also newly differentiated, religious sphere. The boundaries are well kept, only they are relocated drastically, pushing religion into the margins and into the private sphere. In the Anglo-Protestant cultural area by context, and particularly in the United States, there was collusion between religion and the secular differentiated spheres. There is little historical evidence of any tension between American Protestantism and capitalism, and very little manifest tension between science and religion in America prior to the Darwinian crisis at the end of the 19th century. The American Enlightenment had hardly any anti-religious component, even the separation of church and state that was constitutionally codified in the dual clause of the First Amendment had as much the purpose of protecting the free exercise of religion from a state interference as that of protecting the federal state from any religious entanglement. It is rare, at least until very recently, to find any progressive social movement in America appealing to secularist values. The appeals to the gospel and to Christian values are certainly much more common throughout the history of American social movements as well as in the discourse of American presidents. The purpose of this comparison is not to reiterate the well-known fact that American society is more religious and therefore less secular than European societies. While the first may be true, the second proposition does not follow. On the contrary, the United States has always been the paradigmatic form of a modern secular differentiated society. Yet, the triumph of the secular came aided by religion rather than at its expense. And the boundaries themselves became so diffuse that at least by European ecclesiastical standards, it is not clear where religion begins and the secular ends. Yet it would be ludicrous to argue that the United States is a less functional differentiated society and therefore less modern and therefore less secular than France or Sweden. On the contrary, one could argue that there is less functional differentiation of a state, economy, science, etc. in France than in the United States. Yet this does not make France either less modern or less secular than the United States. If the European concept of secularization is not a particularly relevant category for the Christian United States, precisely because the United States never had a territorial church from which either a state or society needed to be disestablished, much less may the concept be directly applicable to other axial civilizations with very different modes of structuration of the religious and the secular. As an analytical conceptualization of the historical process, secularization is a category that makes sense within the context of the particular internal and external dynamics of the transformation of Western European Christianity from the Middle Ages to the present. But the category becomes problematic once it is generalized as a universal process of societal development and once it is transferred to other world religions and other civilizational areas with very different dynamics of structuration of the relations and tensions between religion and war or between cosmological transcendence and worldly immanence. While secularizations refer to the empirical historical process of differentiation of the religious and secular spheres, secularisms, as a worldview or as an ideology, refers more specifically to the kind of secular ideas which may be either consciously held and explicitly elaborated into historical, philosophical, and normative ideological estate projects, projects of modernity and cultural programs, or as an epistemic knowledge regime that may be unreflexively held and phenomenologically assumed as the taken for granted normal structure of modern reality, <coughs> as a modern doxa, or as an unthought. Let me illustrate the point with a comparison of public opinion surveys in Europe and the United States. We know that people lie to the pollsters. In America, they claim that they are more religious than they really are, that they go more frequently to church, that they pray more frequently than they actually do. In Europe, it's the other way around. 
If you are somebody, are you religious? God forbid, of course I'm not religious. What do you think? I'm a modern, secular, enlightened European. Namely, Americans assume that to be a good American means to be religious, and they feel guilty when they are not as religious as they ought to be. Europeans believe that to be a modern European means to be secular, and they feel guilty when they still find some religion within themselves. It is this type of very different type of secularisms, if you wish, or ideas of what the secular is, that define the situation in the United States and throughout Europe. And uh, I could go and illustration from different European countries, and how within each European country, however, these perceptions themselves change from France to Germany to, to England to, 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 to Sweden. Um, the point which I've been trying to make now for several years is that to understand the drastic secularization of European societies in the last 40, 50 years, because really it happened in the 60s. Really it happened in the 60s and since the 60s. Uh, this kind of self-fulfilling prophecy of the secularization theory, the fact that most Europeans have taken for granted the assumptions of the theory of secularization, the fact that this has become the unthought namely the doxa of European thought by social scientists, politicians, journalists, ordinary people, goes more to explain the drastic separation of European societies than any theory of correlation of modernization, economic development, urbanization, education, etc., and uh, uh, rates of religious belief or unbelief. But modern secularism also comes in many multiple historical forms in terms of different normative models of legal constitutional separation of the secular state and religion, or in terms of the different types of cognitive differentiation between science, philosophy, and theology, or in terms of the different models of practical differentiation between law, morality, and religion, etc. Think of the rather different models of separation of church and state, and therefore also of democracies. In the United States, in France, in Turkey, and in India. All four are four very clear secular states uh, with very clear separation of church and state, but the relation of religion and politics in each of them, and the relation of the type of democracy which this relationship fosters or inhibits is very, very different. Uh, and here I'm going to go to my next topic on Islam, uh, linking it with uh, how these secularist prejudices are a problem. A cursory review of contemporary theories of religious fundamentalism can help illustrate the way in which secularist assumptions built into our theories of modernity unwittingly distort our social scientific analysis and our understanding of the ways in which religion and religious movements of all kinds are implicated in political conflicts throughout the world. Indeed, our theories of religious fundamentalism only make sense as counterparts of our theories of secularization. But we need to put into question the basic tendency to interpret the, the most diverse contemporary religious movements as a fundamentalist reaction to the world historical process of secularization, as instances of a global conflict between religion and secular modernity. Indeed, if one takes away the premise of the universal process of secularization, then the analytical category of religious fundamentalism loses most of its interpretative relevance. And of course, it means that we now need to study seriously how different these religious movements are when they're putting all of them together under this analytical category of fundamentalism. Uh, nowhere are those secularist assumptions more problematic than in contemporary global discourses on Islam as an anti-mother and democratic fundamentalist religion. Against the often repeated claim that Islam is religion and a state, and therefore knows no clear differentiation of religion and politics, even a superficial acquaintance with the complex history of pre modern Muslim societies across three continents in over a millennium makes abundantly clear that the patterns of relations and indeed differentiation between religious and political institutions and structures are as diverse as anything one finds in Western Christendom or indeed in any other world religion. And yet, despite the also contemporary multifaceted varieties of the public forms of modern Islam, 
the contemporary global discourse on Islam, at least in the West, tends to depict Islam uniformly as an essentially fundamentalist, anti-modern, and anti-democratic religion. Secularist assumptions of a homogeneous cosmopolitan secular modernity, which are still dominant throughout Europe and within the social sciences, and which tend to characterize every form of public religion resisting privatization and secular differentiation as fundamentalists, have been joined with Huntington's highly influential thesis of the class of civilizations to form a very distort distorted view of global Islam. I can't claim any expertise on Islam, but as a student of global Catholicism, for me, the similarities between today's discourse on Islam as a fundamentalist anti-modern religion in comparison with democracy and yesterday's discourse on Catholicism are indeed striking. From the 1830s to the 1960s, anti-Catholic Protestant nativism in America was based on the alleged incompatibility between republicanism and Romanism. In his portrayals of Catholics in America, Tocqueville had already tried to refute this thesis, as well as the widely held perception on both sides of the French Republican racist and monarchist Catholic divide that Catholicism was incompatible with modern democracy and with individual freedoms. As in the case of Catholicism before, the internal and external debates over the compatibility between Islam and democracy and modern individual freedoms is taking place at three separate yet interrelated levels. In the debates over the proper articulation of a Muslim Ummah in diasporic context outside of Dar al Islam. In debates over the democratic legitimacy of Muslim political parties in Turkey and elsewhere, which, like their at first equally suspect Catholic counterparts, may establish new forms of Muslim democracy akin to Christian democracy. And in debates over the alleged class of civilization between Islam and the West at the geopolitical level, with clear parallels with the earlier debates on the class between republicanism and Romanism. Under conditions of globalization, all three issues have become ever more entangled, feeding upon the resonance of Huntington's thesis. Huntington's own analysis of the third wave of democratization, which he characterizes as a Catholic wave, can be used to question his essentialist assumptions. Roughly two-thirds of the 30-some countries that underwent successful transitions to democracy since the mid-70s were Catholic, what means that prior to the time most Catholic countries were authoritarian, and authoritarian regimes. <clears throat> Moreover, Catholic group, groups played a prominent role in democratic transitions even in countries where they constituted a small minority, such as South Korea or South Africa. In this respect, it was a Catholic wave, not just because the countries where it occurred happened to be Catholic, but because the transformation of Catholicism associated with the adjournment of the Second Vatican Council was itself an important independent factor in producing the wave. Had Huntington developed his argument only a few decades earlier, before the Catholic adjournment, his formulation would possibly have taken the form of the class between the Protestant secular West against the rest. And Catholic culture could have been easily construed as essentially inimical to democracy. Irrespective of how one judges the old anti-Catholic prejudices, the swift and radical transformation of the political culture of Catholic countries is the result of the re official reformulation of the religious teachings of the Catholic Church puts into question the notion of the unchanging core essence of a world religion as dogmatically structured as Catholicism. The premise of an unchanging core essence should even be less valid for other world religions with a less dogmatically structured doctrinal core or with a more pluralistic and contested system of authoritative interpretation of the religious tradition. More than the ongoing intellectual debates among Orientalist and experts concerning the nation of Islam, it is the very open and contentious contemporary debates among Muslims concerning their own tradition that raise the question as to what constitutes, if not the essential core of Islam as a civilization, certainly its authoritative interpretation and its authentic representation today. But essentialist interpretations of Islam tend to preclude the possibility that contemporary Muslims may find their own models of Muslim adjournmentos 
plural, they are likely to be plural, which, like the Catholic one, would offer viable responses attuned both to their religious tradition and to modern requirements. The comparison with Catholicism may be instructive because, like Islam today, it was viewed for a long time as the paradigmatic anti modern fundamentalist religion. Catholicism served as the central focus of the Enlightenment critical religion. It offered for centuries the most spirited, principled, and seemingly futile resistance to modern process of secularization and modernization. Even after its official accommodation with secular modernity, and after relinquishing its identity as a monopolistic state church, the Catholic Church refuses to become just a private religion, just an individual private belief. It was to be both mother and public. Indeed, since Vatican II, it has kept a highly public profile throughout the world. Looking at the ongoing contemporary reformulations of the Islamic tradition, from the comparative perspective of the Catholic aggiornamento, may serve at least to relativize constructions of a class within Islam in the West. The problem, so often reiterated by the critics, is not just that Huntington's analysis and similar ones rest on an essentialist conception of Islam, but the construction of the West, on which it is based, is no less essentialist. The juxtaposition of Catholicism and Islam shows that the problem lies not only in simplistic depictions of the uniform fundamentalist Islam that fail to acknowledge the extraordinary diversity one finds among Muslim societies in the past and the present, equally problematic and misleading is the essentialist construction of a modern secular West that fails to recognize Catholic Christianity as an integral part of the past and present of Western modernity. Every incrimination of Islam as a fundamentalist, anti-modern, anti-Western religion could have been directed justifiably against Catholicism not long time ago. There are, of course, many significant differences between the two adjournamentos. I will only draw attention here to the most crucial one. The Catholic transformation had the character of an official, relatively <coughs> uniform, and swift reform from above that found little contestation from below and could easily be enforced across the Catholic world, generating as a result a remarkable global homogenization of Catholic culture, at least among the elites, uh, among the elites. Islam, by contrast, lacks centralized institutions and administrative structures to define and enforce official doctrines, and therefore, the ongoing Muslim adjournamentos to modern global realities and predicaments are likely to be plural, with multiple, diverse, and often contradictory outcomes. One should be open to the possibility that the Islamic tradition is distinctive public discourse and Muslim practices will inform and shape the type of civil society and the democratic institutions that may emerge in Muslim countries. There are multiple Western modernities, and there will likely be multiple Muslim modernities. There is no guarantee, indeed, it is unlikely that movements of Islamic revival or renewal will be uniformly conducive to democratization. What is more certain is the democracies are likely to grow and thrive in Muslim countries, and the political actors who are striving for it are also able to frame their discourse in a publicly recognizable Islamic idiom. Calls for the privatization of Islam as a condition for modern democracy in Muslim countries will only produce anti-democratic Islamist responses. By contrast, the public reflexive elaboration of Islam's normative traditions in response to modern challenges political learning experiences and global discourses has a chance to generate various forms of public civil Islam that may be conducive to democratization. The contemporary transformation of Muslim polities in Turkey offers, perhaps, the best illustration of Muslim democratization and the most compelling refutation of Huntington's thesis. In the case of civilizations, Huntington depicts Turkey as the classic and paradigmatic case of a torn country. That is a country with a single predominant Muslim culture whose leaders want to shift it to the West. Given his essentialist conception of civilizations, Huntington considers such a task nearly impossible. Indeed, he argues that Turkey, and I quote, having experienced the bad and the good of the West in secularism and democracy, 
and of course, is perhaps the best qualified candidate to become the core a state of global Islam. Huntington would actually welcome such a transformation of Turkey from a secular to a Muslim state, if only to fulfill his own prophecy of the inevitable class of civilizations. And what? At some point, Turkey could be ready to give up its frustrating and humiliating role as a beggar, pleading for membership in the West, and to resume its much more impressive and elevated historical role as the principal Islamic interlocutor and antagonist of the West. End of quote. According to Huntington, the least requirements must be met for a torn country to redefine successfully its civilizational identity. First, the political and economic elite of the country has to be generally supportive of and enthusiastic about this move. Second, the public has to be at least willing to acquiesce in the redefinition of identity. And third, the dominant elements in the whole civilization, in most cases the West, have to be willing to embrace the common. End of quote. In the case of Turkey, the first requirement has been a given since the 1920s when Mustafa Kemal, Mustafa Kemal, father of the Turks, was bent upon begetting a modern Western secular Republican Turkish nation state based on the principles of positive secularism modeled after French Republican laicite, Jacobin estatism, and vanguard elitism. Ultimately, the project of constructing such a nation state from above was bound to fail because it was too secular for the Islamists, too Sunni for the Alevis, and too Turkish for the Kurds. A Turkish state in which the collective identities and interests of those groups that constitute the overwhelming majority of the population cannot find public representation, cannot possibly be a truly representative democracy, even if it is founded on modern secular Republican principles. But Muslim democracy is as possible and viable today in Turkey as Christian democracy was half a century ago in Western Europe. Secular Europeans, apprehensive of Muslim political parties or of any other religious political party for that matter, seem to have forgotten that the initial project of a European Union was basically a Christian democratic project, sanctioned by the Vatican at the time of a general religious revival in post-World War II Europe in the geopolitical context of the Cold War between the free world and Christian when, excuse me, to the Cold War when the free world and Christian civilization had become synonymous. But this is a forgotten history that secular Europeans, proud of having outgrown a religious past from which they feel liberated, would prefer not to remember. Moreover, practically every continental European country has had religious parties at one time or another. Many of them particularly the Catholic ones, had dubious democratic credentials until the negative learning experience of fascism turned them into Christian democratic parties. Turkey has been patiently knocking on the door of the European club since 1959. But until very recently, there was no chance that Turkey could or actually seem eager to meet the EU, EU's stringent economic and political conditions for membership. Only after the landslide victory of Recep Tayyip Erdogan's Justice and Development Party in November 2002 have the structural conditions been created to introduce the kind of constitutional, legal, and democratic reforms that makes the European Union membership possible. The paradox, therefore, is that only the rise of mass and democracy in Turkey has created the conditions for real democratization and authentic Europeanization of society and of the state. The present government is certainly the most representative democratic government of all of Turkey's modern history. A wide consensus, moreover, has seemingly been reached among the Turkish population, so in the Turkey on the issue of joining Europe and thus the West is no longer a torn country, or at least it was not until very recently, now for the first time, public union polls in Turkey also saw that only 49% are willing to join the EU, when a year and a half ago, up to 70% were ready to join the EU. Huntington's second requirement, therefore, has also been made. What is less clear is whether the third requirement will follow, namely whether the Europeans, the political elite, as well as ordinary citizens, are willing, if not to embrace, at least to admit a modern Muslim democratic Turkey into the European Union. 
the widespread and contentious debate within Europe has revealed how much Islam, with all its distorted representations as the other of Western civilization, is the real issue, rather than the extent to which Turkey may be ready to meet the same stringent economic and political conditions as all other new members. The public debates in Europe over Turkey's admission have shown that Europe is actually the torn country, deeply divided over its cultural identity, unable to answer the question whether European identity and therefore its external and internal boundaries should be defined by the common heritage of Christianity and Western civilization, whatever it means, or by its mother secular values of liberalism, universal human rights, political democracy, and tolerant and inclusive multiculturalism. The paradox and the quandary for modern secular Europeans who have set their traditional historical Christian identities in a rapid and drastic process of secularization that has coincided with the very success of the process of European integration and who therefore identify European modernity with secularization is that they observe with some apprehension the reverse process in Turkey. The more modern or at least democratic Turkish politics become, the more publicly Muslim and less secularist they also tend to become. In its determination to join the European Union, Turkey is adamantly staking its claim to be, or its right to become, a fully European country economically and politically, while simultaneously fashioning its own model of Muslim cultural modernity. It is this very claim to be simultaneously a modern European and a culturally Muslim country that baffles European civilizational identities, secular and Christian alike. It contradicts both the definition of a Christian Europe and the definition of a secular Europe. The specter of millions of Turkish citizens already in Europe, but not of Europe, many of them second generation immigrants, caught between all countries they have left behind, and their European host societies unable or unwilling to fully assimilate them, only makes the problem the more visible. The question of the integration of Turkey into the European Union is inevitably intertwined, implicitly if not explicitly, with the question of the failed integration of Muslim immigrants, and in turn, the way in which Europe resolves both questions will determine not only Europe's civilizational identity, but the role of Europe in the emerging global order. When confronted immigrants in their midst, and here I enter into the third topic, uh, immigration, transnational migration, transnational religion, Europeans rarely reflect upon the fact that throughout the modern era, European societies have been the primary immigrant sending region in the world, region in the world. In the last decades, however, the migration flows have reversed, and many Western European societies have become instead centers of global immigration. But European societies still have difficulty viewing themselves as permanent immigrant societies or viewing the native second generation as nationals irrespective of their legal status. They prefer to maintain the illusion that immigration is a temporary phenomenon, that those are guest workers that can be sent home or refuse entry whenever it's convenient. But unless it is willing to turn itself into fortress Europe with heavily political, heavily police external borders, and thus belie the self-image of cosmopolitan modernity it would like to have, the European Union is likely to be able, is unlikely to be able to stop completely the constant global flow of refugees and of legal and illegal immigration. What makes the immigrant question particularly thorny in Europe and inextricably intertwined with the Turkish question is the fact that in Europe immigration and Islam are almost synonymous or were until very recently. The overwhelming majority of immigrants in most European countries, the UK being the main exception, were until very recently Muslims, and the overwhelming majority of Western European Muslims were immigrants. This entails a superimposition of different dimensions of otherness that exacerbates issues of boundaries, accommodation, and incorporation. The immigrant, the religious, the racial, and the socioeconomic privileged other all tend to coincide. Moreover, all those dimensions of otherness now become superimposed upon Islam so that Islam becomes the utterly other. After September 11, the global war on terror, and the ever more visible proliferation of global Muslim discourses and networks, as well as global discourses on Islam, unveiling, 
in an Islamic fundamentalist system, in Europe, all those developments have conflated into a panic that can only be characterized as <coughs> Islamophobia. Anti-immigrant xenophobic nativism, the conservative defense of Christian culture and civilization, secularist anti-religion prejudices, liberal feminist critiques of Muslim patriarchal fundamentalism, and the fear of Islamist terrorist networks are being fused indiscriminately throughout Europe into a uniform anti-Muslim discourse which practically precludes the kind of mutual accommodation between immigrant groups and host societies that is necessary for successful immigrant incorporation. The parallels with Protestant, Republican, and Catholic nativism in mid-19th century America are indeed striking. Today's totalizing discourse on Islam is an essentially anti-modern, fundamentalist, illiberal, and democratic religion and culture echoes the 19th century discourse on Catholicism. For this new and different, however, is the strength of European secular identities. I've written recently a paper comparing immigration and the new religious pluralism in Europe and the United States, which is forthcoming with Oxford University Press in a book edited by Thomas Panchoff and the new religious pluralism and democracy. So rather than summarizing my argument here, I urge to go and read the book, as the moment is out, I believe, in late spring, or at least my article. <laughs> what I would like to do in my final minutes is to present a few reflections on the interrelation between transnational religions, transnational migrations, and globalization. If by globalization we mean, in its objective dimension, the process of increasing interconnectedness of all societies, peoples, and cultures of the world, and in its subjective dimension, the growing reflexive awareness of belonging to one single global imagined community that inhabits one single global space and shares the same global time, then it should be obvious that trans societal migrations and the world religions are today and have always been dynamically interrelated in manifold ways with process of globalization. Trans societal migrations and the world religions, at times separated but often in conjunction with each other, have always served as import important carriers of process of globalization. In a certain sense, one could argue that the successive waves of migration of Homo sapiens out of Africa some 50,000 years ago and the subsequent settlements throughout the globe constitute the point of departure of the process of globalization. But these migrations had no subjective dimension of reflexive consciousness and can only now be reconstructed objectively thanks to advances in DNA and other scientific technologies. By contrast, the subjective dimension of imagining a single humanity sharing the same global space and the same global time was first anticipated in all universalistic world religions. Yet these imaginary um, and thus utopian anticipations, while serving as preconditions for the civilizational expansion of the world religions, lacked in a structural and objective and material global base. Until very recently, the civilizational oikumen of all world religions had very clear territorial limits set by the very world regimes in which those religions were civilizationally and thus territorially embedded, and by the geographically circumscribed limitations of the existing means of communication. What constitutes the truly novel aspect of the present global condition is precisely the fact that all world religions can be reconstituted for the first time as deterritorialized global imagined communities detached from the civilizational settings in which they have been traditionally embedded. Paraphrasing Arjuna Padurai's image of modernity at large, one could say that the world religions, through the linking of electronic mass media and mass migration, are being reconstituted as deterritorialized global religions at large. For that very reason, Huntington's thesis of the impending class of civilizations is simultaneously illuminating of the present condition and profoundly misleading. It is illuminating insofar as it was one of the first prominent voices calling attention to the increasing relevance of civilizations and civilizational identities 
in the emerging global order and in global conflicts. But it is also profoundly misleading insofar as it still conceives of civilizations as territorial geopolitical units akin to superpowers having some world religion as its cultural core. While by no means anachronistic, indeed the tragic events of September 11 and the ensuing global war on terror demonstrate the extent to which the thesis of the class of civilizations can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Nevertheless, such a conception misses the fact that what is characteristically novel of the present global condition is the emerging dissociation of world religions, civilizational identities, and geopolitical territories. This present dissociation is by no means uniform <coughs> or homogeneous across world religions and civilizations, and indeed it encounters much resistance on the part of the states, which still aspire not only to the monopolistic control of the means of violence, but also to the administrative regulation of religious groups and cultural identities over their territories, as well as on the part of churches, in the broad Bavarian sense of the term, as religious institutions which claim or aspire to religious monopoly over their civilizational or national territories. Much of the problematic debates over religious fundamentalist resistance to secular modernity is related to those issues. Actually, one finds practically everywhere similar tensions between the protectionist, protectionist impulse to claim religious monopoly over civilizational territories and the ecumenical impulse to present one's own particular religion as the response to the universal needs of global humanity. Transnational migrations and the emergence of diasporas of all world religions beyond their civilizational territories make this tension visible everywhere. Of course, neither transnational migrations nor the resulting diasporas are a novel phenomena per se. It is the general, almost universal character of the, of the phenomenon under no, novel global conditions that makes it particularly relevant for all world religions and turns it into a significant global religious matter. I could go on and on, but something must be unsaid for the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jose, for a, a wonderfully wide-ranging and fascinating presentation. We do have about 15, 20 minutes for, do, for discussion, so I would ask people who would like to ask a question to, to stand up and introduce yourselves, and please keep your questions short. The floor is open. Thank you so much for the presentation. I see your point about the de-territorialization de of religion. But then uh, there are also, there is the phenomena of uh, many religious movements in which nationalism is coming back, is making a comeback. Right. And isn't this a sense of uh, bringing territorial identities uh, back into religious discourse? Of course, the modern state is defined territorial. And the mother nation they find territory. So, insofar as you have process of state formation after World War II, everywhere in the world, post colonial and post colonial nationalism everywhere, those are process of territorialization. At the moment, precisely when the original system of territorial nation states is being deconstructed in Europe and established in the European Union, so we have the paradox that where the whole system was established first and then was globalized, uh, it is being globalized and becomes really succeeds in territorializing every single inch of territory on the globe and every single person so that no person on the world can be deterritorialized. At the very moment when this is, uh, has succeeded, the very model begins to fall apart also in other places. And of course the great paradox about religions is the great, the first model deterritorialized diaspora religion, Judaism, becomes territorialized. Precisely the very moment when the global religions are being deterritorialized. And so the process of territorialization in the Middle East, which is always related to, the, for the first time, the territorialization of one world religion back into the so-called uh, uh, homeland, then of course is a, a, a lot of dynamics. Of course, those dynamics, as I said, are not uniform, not homogeneous, and always you have this conflict between the definition of your own religion and civilization in territorial terms and one in ecumenical terms for humanity. Right? And so this is, this is a fundamental issue with all religions in different ways. Hinduism, of course, was conceived territorially. The notion of diaspora Hinduism didn't make much sense. 
But now, you have a global Hindu Umma. In the same way, you have a global Muslim Umma. Right? The notion of a global Hindu Umma would have been totally uh, unthinkable or meaningless only 100 years ago. But it, today, it's as much uh, present as the notion of a global Muslim Umma. Marjorie Mandel Sambal's or Sociology and Anthropology. Uh, I very much take your point about issues of, of failed integration in Europe and your key case of Turkey. But I'm wondering if you can help us differentiate uh, more or less successful integration within Europe. In other words, if we start making some uh, uh, categorizations on the basis of your own thesis. Of course, France had been the only immigrant society in Europe, the one that was also established, like the United States, as a republican system based on a civil religion. Whoever accepts our civil religion becomes French, the same way that whoever accepts our American religion civil religion becomes American. Right? So in this state, there was a process of uh, uh, Francification, we can call it, the same way there's a process of Americanization of immigrants. The interesting question is that precisely this even there. This process has fallen apart, and let's not forget that actually it was not immigrants that were, of course, the riots, let's say, uh, uh, um, last summer, I mean, not the summer, but the previous one, but it was really uh, second and third generation immigrants that should by then have been totally French Republican citizens, right? So, on the one hand, of course, there have been, I'm not in Germany, there has been a lot of success also in integrating uh, Turkish immigrants. They have many, many important. Turkish German citizens who are leading writers, filmmakers, and so on, and you know, also on television, public figures. But I'm worried, I mean, it is a kind of a paper written to the French, to, to the European public uh, uh, sphere. Because even Holland, a country that probably was the most successful of them all in creating a similar, the old model of the pillar, a Muslim pillar, but the moment, of course, the other pillars, the Catholic, the Protestant, the secular, disappear, the emergence or the sole maintenance of one single Muslim pillar against the rest of a Dutch society, which is not defined anymore of pillars, becomes of course a problem. So you have this paradox that the most tolerant society in Europe that was always welcome, welcoming every single foreign, whether it was uh, Sephardic Jews from, from uh, Spain or Portugal, whether it was Puritans from England, whether it was Libertines from the Enlightenment and, and you know, anti monarchic Republican atheists, anybody, any religious, any persecuted minority anywhere was welcome in Holland. And they didn't need to become Dutch. They could maintain their identity, and Holland accepted these people. Now, we have this situation where, for the sake of protecting and defending our own tolerant society, we need to be intolerant with those other people. So, this paradox of tolerant society becoming intolerant for the sake of the thing our own tolerant. A moment when every Dutch has to be like us. And if you want to be Dutch, you have to think like us. And so we expose you to, let's say, naked figures when you want to become a Dutch citizen, so that you know that this is part of Dutch culture. <laughs> this very notion that to be Dutch means to be like us is so un-Dutch. And yet, this is, and this is the kind of, of paradoxes that I'm observing uh, throughout Europe. Any student questions? <laughs> I consider myself a good student. <laughs> <laughs> like uh, <laughs> student. Sure. <laughs> in the Department of Government. We met in Berlin in the fall. It's nice to see you again. Uh, I wanted to ask, uh, it strikes me that a tone that underlies much of the uh, really modern academic concern about the rise of fundamentalism takes the form of how do we make these people uh, more moderate? But you had an arresting moment, I thought, early in your talk, where you suggested, I think the phrase was that uh, remove, in some ways, the, the thesis, or the governing thesis of secularization, you remove a major foundation of modern fundamentalism. I hope I heard that correctly. Well, when I said that the category of fundamentalism, putting all these religious movements together only makes sense as one single thing, right. as the opposite of secularization. So only as so a counter if, Right, so if that's the case, then, then one conclusion to be drawn from that is, in some sense, is not that the job of, perhaps, modern, perhaps secular-minded, elite academics is to make fundamentalism more moderate, but in some ways to go back or to reconsider secularization, which I think is part of what you're doing. Well, what but is, is that itself a kind of fundamental attack on one's own modern faith? 
Well, no, it means to be critical and reflexive. I don't mind uh, Europeans saying, I want to be secular, I want to be different than the rest of the world, as long as I do it because I want to be European, this is my tradition. But if I do it because I want to be modern, and because I want to be so modern that to be modern I have to be, I have to abandon my tradition, it is this notion that uh, uh, the precondition for being modern is to abandon religion. That is the kind of secularism which is unreflexive and critical, that assumes as a kind of an evolutionary development that we have to accept and, and incorporate we want to be modern. Now, if I want to be secular, if I want to be an atheist, I have the right to be an atheist. Well, I cannot hide my own fundamentalism by thinking that I am the modern, enlightened <laughs> individual because I am a secular, while the others are still these primitive religious people <laughs> who have not yet reached my level of development. It is this kind of, it's not so far, it's not you have to become religious, no. You can be a secular, but a reflexively, critically so, for the right reasons, not because you are more developed than you have to. So this is the kind of argument in Brazil. It's not, the, the question is not to become religious again. I'm not proposing that people should become religious. What I am proposing is that if you are a secular, you should know why you are secular, not because you want to be mother. And, it, and therefore, it's not a choice then, but it's something you, you have to do. It's kind of a fashion. And I see in my own country, Spain, that wants to be modern so badly. And people just move from being other directed from conservative traditions to being modern directed. So anything which is fashionable, drugs, sex, whatever, has to be done very quickly by everybody because it was the, the, the need to be modern. It's this kind of social pressure and the kind of uh, uh, definition of the situation which I'm critically putting into question. Can I just follow if, 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 if you have this kind of reflexive, uh, kind of secular worldview, does that, does that then change? How do you see that potentially changing the kind of discourse or dialogue then that takes place between people who identify then as secular or atheist or however you want to put it, versus those who might identify as fundamentalists? In other words, beyond simply saying we're going to be reflexive, does it change the terms of the debate or the it terms changes, of the It changes because the you don't recognize your own particularity and you don't hide behind a false universalism. Because precisely the claim of the European particularity is the universal human development. And this is what precisely the ideology does. What secularism and ideology does is to basically hide a very particular European historical development with universalist clothes and pretensions. And therefore, the others, if they want to be modern, they have become like me. No. I mean, there are different particular forms of being modern. The European is one, and there are many others. And within Europe, there are different ways of being modern. So it's not only, so this is the, the historicization, therefore, the, the, the critical reflection of this uh, uh, undefensible universalist claim. Um, one statement that you made caught my attention. First, I want to make sure I heard you correctly, and then I have a follow-up question. I thought I heard you say that when in terms of globalization becoming a subjective reality, it was first conceived or long conceived uh, within the conscious. Okay, within the consciousness of world religions. Right. Okay. Right. So if that's correct, then is it possible to look historically to the example of various religious traditions? as a normative model of globalization, or perhaps even a source for theory and methods uh, in the globalization process. Can you do that in the context of, I guess, your, I gather your specialization is Catholicism, right. and, and do that uh, overcoming the obvious uh, you know, problems of conquest and colonization? Of course, on the one hand, you have a Pope who claims to speak burbi et orbi to the city and to the world. They always claim that the Pope was speaking to the world, to humanity, because it was the religion of humanity. Right? So there was this claim already, always present. And part of this claim, of course, was let's make everybody Catholic, even if necessary by force, right? Claiming to speak would be an Orbi and, 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 and so on. Then you have competing universalisms. So what the world religions, all of them are facing today, is that, well, before you may have geopolitical countries with one another, and they were uh, resources through territorial appropriation, sometimes accommodation. Now they have to be able to live to one another and accept religious pluralism as part of the situation of global humanity. So what this notion of globalization implies the recognition that the global order is not going to be based on a secular cosmopolitan single imagined community, but it's going to be based indeed on many different imagined communities that imagine our global humanity differently and have a say and they will compete 
to define this humanity for everybody. So you, you, you can expect conflicts, uh, uh, tensions, in defining how the world should be organized. And certainly, I mean, we can expect that in this respect, Huntington is right. Uh, the West got it right, and they thought that you know, they could globalize the war, and the, the modernity would be Western modernity everywhere. Well, no, it's going to be very different. And yes, let's wait a few decades until China and India really develop, and then we'll see that uh, the West here yeah, is a part of uh, uh, the globe. And so we are going to have competing multiple modernities, many of them linked to uh, religious or civilizational traditions. So it has to do with precisely the interconnection of processes that already existed before, but now all of these claims uh, will have to learn to live together in the same planet. Hopefully we can do it without clashing with one another. This, this is basically the, the, the idea. We have time for two more questions here and then here. Hi, I'm Erin Sema, uh, a student. Historically, it appears as if um, the territorialization or diaspora has led to assimilation. And um, one thought is that assimilation can lead to either um, I guess populations of people who are tolerant, maybe more pluralistic. It has also led to communities that become detached from the societies that they're in. And then I guess the other extreme, you have those communities who are assimilated to such a degree that they become so I'm curious about, I guess, your views on assimilation and the role of assimilation in Of course, the word assimilation now is a bad, a politically incorrect word. Uh, we talk of integration, right? <laughs> the word incorpor incorporation, right? Integration, the incorporation, right? It's a way of incorporation doesn't mean assimilation. It's simply incorporate, right? Uh, um, how to incorporate. Obviously, on the one hand, we could say, if we look even at the United States, the country that had this model of assimilation, you had different patterns for assimilation at different times. You could say, if the uh, borders would have not been closed so drastically in the 20s by the uh, draconian anti-immigration laws, and immigration would have continued, it's not clear that indeed assimilation would have take, uh, taken place the way it happened. Right? Uh, precisely, it was because the borders were closed, and part of the reason was let's give some pause for this foreign body to be incorporated, otherwise our body will change so drastically that we will not recognize each other. So there was a moment where, of course, the majority wants to maintain a certain identity. There may come a point of no return, and I think that, I mean, we don't know what's going to happen to the United States. My claim is that against precisely Huntington's who are we, and trying to maintain this Anglo-Saxon protest and this WASP, identity of what America is, basically we've become the first global society, not the first nation, as Lips had said, made up of all European nations, because it was the model, a American nation made up of all European nations, of European ethnics, it was the model, but the first global society made up of all world religious and all civilizations. This is the really, truly interesting aspect of the experiment. At the very moment when there is a claim of the class of civilizations, we are uh, experimenting here with bringing all civilizations together as part of the same society. And of course, this is what the interesting question of how a Christian nation that was defined as Christian, that meant Protestant, Catholics were not Christian, it was more anti-Catholic than anti-Semitic or anti-Hebraic, how Catholicism and Judaism became American religious. Not only religious in America, but American religious in a way in which Judaism never became European religion. Judaism, even today, is not fully European religion because Europe is not defined. If it is not defined religiously, a secular Europe, of course, the Jewish identity should disappear. If it is defined as a Christian civilization, Judaism is a foreign religion. Even today, after 2000 years, right? In America, Judaism became an American religion. And Catholicism became a Catholic, a, an American religion. And in the process, both were radically transformed. American Judaism is completely a new, a new form of Judaism. And it has radically transformed world Judaism, and American Catholicism has transformed world Catholicism, I would claim. In the same way, I would claim, today, we have already these dynamic processes of diasporas and territorial civilizational homes. In the case of India, this is very interesting. The development in Islam is more complicated, because you have pretty different diasporas in, in, in Europe and in America, but I would claim, and here, obviously, uh, uh, Yvonne Haddad can help us in, in in this issue, but I think that those dynamics are really, really interesting. And of course, is the process continue and the borders are not closed anymore? 
if really the global process continues, then of course the growing interest in transnationalism is the real issue. The issue is not anymore assimilation, but a completely new situation of the possibility of being both national and transnational, and national in various places at the same time, if it was the possibility of carrying different passports. When, before September 11, President Bush and President Fox of Mexico were the summer of 2001, considering the possibility of a dual citizenship for Mexicans and the US, this would have been inconceivable for Mexican or uh, American presidents to even think about it a decade before. Unthinkable. The notion that we are discussing it, of course, September 11 changed the, the discourse, but this implies how things are changing and will continue changing if globalization continues. Question: uh, Have you been following uh, Benedict XVI's reflections on secularization, and uh, particularly on the re-Christianization of Europe? And would you think that he is subject to the same critique of essentialist models that you made of, say, Huntington? In some respects, yes. In some respects, yes. I mean, uh, uh, I've always had the sense that uh, Benedict XVI, uh, 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 let's call Joseph Ratzinger is basically a German theologian, very German, very European indeed. And he finds uh, 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 easier to have a dialogue with even his own heretic Hans Kim and with, with his secularist other, Habermas, than with other religious leaders. But now, after the, 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 the big uh, uh, gap he made with his speech on uh, Islam, you know, using, of all people, a Byzantine emperor of the uh, 14th century, I guess, to characterize Islam, he has to change at least publicly his position and, and go out of his way towards religious dialogue with Islam. But his instinct is that of a European civilization and Christian identity, which of course the paradox is that uh, Christianity became territorialized and became a European religion around the year 1000, when finally the papal revolution, all of Europe became Christian. And for 1000 years, you could talk of Christian European religion. But today, precisely, Christianity has become global at a time when Europe has become post-Christian. And the most interesting developments within Christianity, both Catholicism and Protestantism, happen not in the old world, but in the new world and in the south, whether Pentecostalism throughout the world, whether Catholicism, the core of these vibrant religious movements, both within Catholicism and, 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 and Protestantism, are not in Europe, and one could even say not anymore as much in the United States as precisely in other parts of the world. So in this respect, to a certain extent, yes, and, and this model of reason and faith, precisely, is the kind of the counterpart of the same. I mean, it's the counterpart of, of those people that are before the reason, because I'm a reasonable man, I'm a rational man, I cannot believe or the other. So I think that he is very much a structure within the old country categories of the Enlightenment, secularism versus religion, yes. Thank you, uh, Jose. You've answered some questions. You've raised many more questions that I think, uh, I think I know will be with us for many decades to come. We do have the opportunity to continue the conversation over coffee, so please join us, and please join me in thanking our speaker once again.